Hey everybody, welcome to the History of D&D Weekly for August 8th, 2020. I'm your host, DM Galabond. All right, today on the History of D&D Weekly, we are going to do the first part of the series on original D&D combat rules. Uh, the rules are so different, and there are so many of them, that I'm going to have to break it up into at least two weeks. So today we're going to do like the normal combat procedures. So normal weapon combat, melee and range including um, spell combat, that type of stuff. Uh, in the next part of this, we're going to get into more specialized combat rules, special situations. So unarmed combat rules, there's a whole section on that. There's a section on, um, you know, mass combat, uh, because some of you may know that the original D&D uh, came to fruition out of a very active um, miniatures war game scene that was going on in the 1960s uh, where people would build like these big tables and build terrain and whatnot and they would build miniatures of historically accurate armies with historically um, accurate weapons and there were rules for how your uh, armies would fight against others. So there was this whole set of rules built into original D&D to handle those kinds of massive combat. There's also specialized things like siege combat rules and stuff like that. So well, there's so much of that that we can't fit it all into one episode. Oh, we could, but you'd be sitting there watching for an hour while I go through it. So just going to try to focus on the original combat rules and hopefully keep this to within, you know, a half hour or something like that. Uh, we will see how well we do. All right, let's go ahead and let's get on with the show. All right, so there's a few things that are pretty different. Uh, about combat in uh, original edition and one is that there is a strict order to combat now in later editions they've kind of relaxed the rules but this is one of those things where I, I alluded to the fact earlier that it grew out of miniatures war games and this order of combat, you can really see how it has that pedigree back to those uh, miniature war games. So, um, the combat sequence of events checklist. Now, um, the first thing that happens in every combat round, at least the way they envisioned it initially, is you roll initiative in every combat round. So, the, you don't roll initiative at the beginning of combat, and then those turns go in the same sequence over and over and over and over again. You uh, roll initiative at the top of each round to see who goes first. Now, for people used to later editions, that means that it can kind of take a little bit more time to uh, run combat. For those of us on roll 20, um, we can use, you know, if people get used to doing the, um, doing like initiative macros and stuff, it's not so bad, but it still it does cause a delay from the last person to go in the previous round until you figure out who goes first in the next round. All right, and notice that the combat sequence is for a side not for individual characters it's for the side so the players designate one person to roll initiative and that person's initiative determines the entire initiative for the players the dm rolls one initiative and that determines the initiative for the monsters so 
if the DM has the higher initiative, all of the monsters will go before any of the players can go. If the player has the higher initiative, then all the players will go before the mon the monsters can go. So this is this is a little bit uh, of a different thing. And again, back to those war games rules. All right, so each side rolls one d6 to determine initiative. Makes sense if you're if not every single individual is rolling initiative, you don't really care. You just you just go ahead and you uh, only need to know whether it's higher or lower than a six. First side goes. Side that won the initiative acts first. So there's morale. Monsters and NPCs roll morale checks. Also, anyone who needs to make a saving throw versus an ongoing effect does so now. Uh, notice that happens at the beginning of the round. In later editions, saving throws for ongoing effects, that happens at the end of your turn, not the beginning of your turn. So in some ways, this is nice because if you shake off that effect, well, then you haven't lost your whole turn. You still get to take an action. So movement. Characters who choose to move do so now. You cannot do movement at another phase or another part of the sequence of combat. You must move before you before anybody attacks. Then there's missile combat. So any characters using missile and thrown weapons make their attacks. So if your party consists of, let's say, a um, a wizard with a uh, sling and an arch or a ranger or a, a fighter with a uh, with a bow and then you have a cleric with a mace and you have a fighter with a sword and you have well then that wizard or the magic user I should say because this is original D&D &D, the magic user and the archer will go before the others do um, so they choose their targets make their attack roll they roll damage for any successful hits then Anybody that's using magic casts their spells. So missile weapons go first. Then spells happen. Uh, choose your targets. Targets roll saving throws if appropriate. DM applies uh, damage as a result. And finally, the hand-to-hand -hand happens. So now notice what has happened here. In phase two, you had to move. Phase four, the spells go off. So if Bob the Barbarian, with his big, uh, you know, great axe, decides on movement, that he's going to run up to the orc and get ready to smack him. Um, and then on magic, uh, you know, uh, Mary the magic user decides she wants to set off a fireball. Well, she better be careful about where she puts that fireball because that might hit Bob the Barbarian. Now that he's run up into combat. Um, and if Bob doesn't run in, into combat, then he's going to have to wait until the next round before he can run up and get into into combat. So this is what I'm saying, where, where things happen in a very specific order that's a little bit different to our sensibilities um, if we're used to playing the later games. Then hand-to-hand -hand combat happens so um finally characters fighting hand-to-hand -hand make their attacks now um the mystics all use hand-to-hand -hand, and everybody um is capable of doing hand-to-hand -hand combat like i said we're not going to really get into hand-to-hand -hand this week we're going to put that in next week because it is a little bit of a specialized and and less uh, less common circumstance, but if you're going to do any kind of wrestling or holds or uh, you know grapple, it, what what's called grapples in later editions, but was called holds and wrestling in this edition, you would do that in the hand to hand phase. Then the second side goes. So second side does this whole sequence one through five again, and finally the. Um, special uh, results so if there's any special results that have come about during the round dm will announce those all right so it does uh, that is something to understand about this edition of the game 
I would like to, at least for the first couple of levels, I would like to test this out. One of the whole reasons for doing the history of D&D is to go back and really see what the rules as written were supposed to be like. So that means that it's going to require everybody to buy in that, hey, this is going to work a little bit differently. And you understand that because it works differently, you may get some different kinds of results than you expect from D&D. But the point is to roll with it and have fun with it and experience the differences and not to whine and complain because it's not what you're used to. So that's the thing for people that want to play in this game you need to understand that your recourse to whining about the rules ends when you accept uh, the invitation to the game period zip nope <laughs> zip it as uh, dr evil would say uh all right um and special results so end of the round uh, special actions, attempts to retreat, offers to surrender, resolution of special skills, uh, any of those types of things that may happen. Um, so first action in combat is to roll initiative. And normally, there's group initiative. So DM rolls a 1d6 for the NPCs, and one player rolls a 1d6 for the PCs. Um, and the group that wins the initiative gets to go first. So everybody in that group will go first uh and instead of figuring out what order they go in based on how fast their initiative is uh individually we determine what order they go in by somebody counting down all right morale check and does there anybody need to do a morale check or morale check or saving throws anybody need to do that yes or no okay now movement anybody want to move Everybody who wants to move, go ahead and do it. All right, missile combat. All right, everybody who's going to do missile. Now this is your chance to fire. Then magic. Anybody wants to cast a spell, this is your chance to do it. Uh, so that that precludes doing that. And then the reason that you start every round with a new initiative is because, well, the players may have gone first on the first round, but then the monsters may get to go first on the second round. So uh, this means that it's a little less predictable which side is going to go. And because everybody goes, well, you could really sort of, by winning the initiative on a particular round, you could really sort of change the uh, dynamics of the battlefield if everybody goes first on one side in a particular round. Um, so initiative and multiple attacks. Initiative wins... Um, that has more than one attack, it gets all its attacks before the player characters can act. And likewise, high-level characters with multiple attacks, they get to make all their attacks before the other side gets to go. Um, and ties, if each side rolls the same number for initiative, all the actions happen at once. Um, actions are simultaneous. And now that... Um, so that means, like, if they both get three, then, then it's kind of like up to the up to the DM to adjudicate. Now, since we're going to do this on a stream, this is kind of going to be a little bit crazy. Like, if everybody tries to yell at once, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Well, no, but DM's not going to be able to hear what people are saying and. Uh, the people watching aren't going to be able to know what's going on. So we're going to have to figure that out. Um, I think I think what I will do is on a tie, um, we'll say that everything is simultaneous, but when we get to the morale and saving throw phase, we'll do another initiative and see who gets to go first on the morale and saving throw. And then when it comes to the movement phase, do another saving or do another initiative. Who gets which side gets to move first, and then the same all the way down. So that way it's a little less chaotic. Um, we'll say everything is happening, but you know, one side could get to do their saving throws first. Um, the other side might get to do the movement and the morale first. Then the other side might get to do the magic and the hand hand first. 
and so on and so forth um, in the case of ties. Uh, round where things, okay, even if one character's attack killed an opponent, the opponent gets to roll his attacks because they're taking place simultaneously. Um, so that is an important, uh, important thing, uh, to be aware of. All right, characters who choose to talk, get a few words into what they meant to say before violence erupts. Uh, all characters decide to attack or run, do so. Uh, and then those who chose to talk can run after everyone else has gone. Uh, individual initiative. So now this is an optional rule that they put in um, that everybody rolled a d6 for their own initiative. Um, and the DM rolls a separate d6 for every monster or NPC. So that's a little bit more like the uh, current rules. I think what we might wind up doing, uh, I said I want to try the original rules where it's everybody on one side goes, then everybody on the other side, and then at the top of every round we re-roll initiative. I think that what I'll do is for the first level or two, we'll do that group initiative and roll initiative every round. We'll see how everybody likes that. If people really don't like that, or if it really feels like it's causing problems or really making things confusing, then we might go ahead and switch to individual initiative, um, at which point I will use the uh, dexterity score tiebreaker. So like if your character has a dex of 16, uh, and you roll a three for your initiative on a d6, it would be like 3.16 is your initiative. Uh, that will help to break some of the ties. But then once we do that, we will only ask individuals to do that at the top of the first round of combat. And then we'll just keep the static initiative the rest of the way, since every individual is uh, different. Because, you know, in a in a large combat where you have, you know, like four PCs and you have, you know, six or eight retainers that the PCs are controlling, and then on the other side you have, you know, 20 goblins um, and stuff like that, then it's going to take a long time to roll initiative at the top of each round if every individual is doing that. So we'll just, we'll just do that. All right. So um, dexterity adjustment, that's uh, DM's option. Character's dexterity can modify his individual initiative roll. Yes, I do that. So if you have a bonus on your dexterity, you add that to your initiative roll. Um, and then you use your actual dexterity score as a tiebreaker. So morale, um, and morale is something that generally is used on the um, part of NPCs and monsters. So your retainers will have morale. Uh, every monster in the monster section of the rule book has a morale score. And you roll 2d6, and if the roll is equal to or less than the morale score, the creature pursues combat, otherwise it avoids combat. So let's say it has a morale of um, of 10, and you roll a 3 and a 4 on 2d6, so that's a 7. Uh, it's less than a 10, so it's going to keep fighting. If it rolls an 11, then the creature might uh, run away. Uh, and there are special uh, rules about morale, uh, for instance, on the part of monsters, the first time a monster is killed, then um, all the rest of the monsters roll morale, and they see whether they're going to keep fighting. Um, if the monsters uh, get the first kill and they knock a PC down, oh, well, then they might get a bonus to their morale. Uh, because it, they feel like they're winning. Um, and morale is only a function for monsters and NPCs. Players always decide how their characters act. Okay, so uh, when to check morale. Uh, DM never needs to check morale for a creature with a morale score or 2 or 12. 
Uh, morale score of 2 means the creature always runs away. It will not fight. And score of 12 means it will always pursue combat and fight to the death. Um, so make morale checks at the start of an evasion. When a group tries to evade encounters, DM rolls to see if creatures give chase. Uh, during a chase, every five combat rounds, um, successful morale means they continue to give chase. Failure means they break off the chase. In combat, when a creature is first hit, taking one or more points of damage, it rolls morale. When the creature is reduced to one quarter or less of its starting hit points, it rolls morale. When the first death on either side takes place, the DM makes morale check for all the remaining creatures to see if they wish to continue. When half of the creatures are not free to act because they're dead, asleep, controlled, everybody else makes one. Uh, when a creature or NPC is subjected to a weapons master's weapon master's despair effect, it has to make. And that's a that's a special kind of ability that weapon masters have. And at any time, creature or NPC is subject to a magic item or spell that calls for a morale check. Uh, morale phase, zone phase, and then um goes through how to check morale um adjustments to the morale check um uh, so here are some things for the dm this is sort of pulling behind the curtain to see how this is going to work um uh, situations that can lead to adjustments to the morale check monsters have been sl monsters have slain one or more pcs uh, retainers have lost none of their own members. They get a plus two bonus. Monsters are slain one or more PCs re or retainers and have lost more than one of their own members. Plus one bonus. PCs have been using a lot of magic against the monsters. And the monsters have no equivalent magic. They get a minus one penalty. And DM can adjust morale for check for whatever circumstances. Alright, retainer morale. Retainer's morale is determined by his employer's charisma. And then there's a table, the Charisma table in Chapter 1 on page 10. Uh, has a Charisma score of 18, have the morale scores of 10. Uh, only check retainer's morale during an adventure when the following occurs. So in combat, retainer's employer orders retainers into danger while the employer remains in safer surroundings. Hey, um, that... Uh, go up there and smack that ogre. I'm going to stand over here and have a sandwich. Your retainer's going to look at you and go, say what? And roll a morale check. Um, in morale, or in combat, when the retainer's reduced to one quarter or less of starting hit points, eh, yeah, they're going to do a morale check. Um, if the retainer is subject to a weapon master's despair effect, uh, they will, uh, they will do a morale check. And uh, at any time, the retainer is subject to a magical item or a spell that calls for a morale check. Um, they will go ahead and do so. All right. Uh, and then all the monsters in the book have morale scores. Uh, all NPCs are retainers. They have morale scores based on that. If there are situations where there's not a morale score, okay, the... Um, DM has to make up those rules, and there's some ideas about that. All right, movement. Uh, in 5th edition, if you're used to that, you know that there's a movement score given. And you know if you're going to move and take an action, you can move that movement. If you're just going to move, you can actually double your movement. Well, in original D&D, there is a movement score, and, it's, and that is the movement score for an entire turn outside of combat. If you are not going to take any actions, you can use that entire movement to run or hustle. If you are going to move and take an action, then you take one third of that value. So a lot of characters, for instance, have 120 as their total movement. So they could move 120 feet in a round if they didn't do anything except run. 
if they're going to run up to something and hit it, they can only move a third of that. So they can only use move 40 feet and then take an action. So the encounter speed, a character or a monster may move is full encounter speed movement, um, one third normal movement in one round, and still make his attacks this round. Running speed, a character or a monster may move is full running speed movement, three times normal movement in this round if he's not already engaged in combat, but cannot attack if he does so. A uh, character's normal speed is never used during the combat sequence. Simple quick actions such as drawing a new weapon do not subtract from character's movement, so, um, and then combat maneuvers. The missile, combat, magic, hand-to-hand -hand phases, characters choose maneuvers to perform. Combat maneuvers table shows all the normal combat maneuvers in the order in which they occur within the combat round. Um, so, uh, they can only do one, um, uh, one of the maneuvers per round unless it has multiple attacks option. So, what are the combat maneuvers? Well, you can throw. So you can use any weapon that is thrown. Daggers and hand axes. Successful hit will do damage listed for the weapon. Uh, gets dexterity and magic bonuses to the attack roll. Strength and magic bonuses to any damage roll. Uh, targets must be in range. Fire. Character can use any missile fire weapon. Bows, crossbows, slings. Successful hit to the damage listed. Character gets a dexterity bonus to the attack roll. Targets must be in range of the weapon. Um, and a monster attacking with ranged uh, damage power, such as a dragon's breath, will use this maneuver in combat. Uh, casting spells. Uh, so a character casts spells from memory or from a scroll. A monster attacking with a magical power that doesn't qualify as a ranged attack weapon um, uh, you know, hand-to-hand uh, -hand attacks such as a vampire's charm will use this maneuver in combat. Uh, magic item. Uh, a character with a non-weapon -mag non magical item can use it with this maneuver. Uh, so, and then this tells you when this is performed. So throw happens during the missile phase. Anybody can do it. Fire, missile phase, all characters. Cast a spell, magic phase, all characters, potentially. Um, use magic item, magic phase, all characters. Attack is hand-to-hand -hand phase, all characters. Uh, fighting withdrawal is hand-to-hand -hand phase, all characters. Retreat, hand-to-hand -hand phase, all characters. Lance attack, hand-to-hand um, -hand phase. Now, only fighters, dwarves, and elves can... Use the lance attack. Set spear versus charge. Uh, fighters, demi-humans, and mystics can use the set spear. Multiple attacks. Uh, special options. So characters, the fighter, combat options can use them. Parry. Or uh, smash, special, parry, special, disarm, special. Uh, let's see. Kind of withdraw, retreat. Um, okay. Uh, what's the. Okay. Uh, character can only perform this move when he begins a combat round in hand to hand. This maneuver, a character backs away from the enemy at a rate of five feet per round. So that's. Um, this is something that they used in 4th edition where it was a 5 foot step. This is where it comes from. It comes from the original uh, D&D. Um, and it allows you to move without taking opportunity attacks. Um, then a character can retreat. Uh, they can run away from the enemy at greater than half their encounter speed up to full encounter speed. Forfeits armor class bonus. Uh, of a shield, enemy attacking him later in the combat round, uh, movement phase, or enemy attacking a range weapon receives plus two attack roll bonus this round because they can't use their shield. Uh, lance attacks on a steed. Um, get strength and magic bonus bonuses. Uh, set spear versus charge. Character on foot carrying a spear, pike, sword, shield, or lance can set the weapon versus a charge. Uh, holds a weapon firm, braced against the ground, and towards the onrushing enemy. 
uh, and you have to declare that in order to use that maneuver. Uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. Uh, then let's see. Normally, a character makes his attack on a monster's movement phase, and the monster first moves within range of the weapon. If his attack hits and kills the monster, the monster cannot hurt him in, in return. If the attack fails to kill the monster, the monster will be able to attack on its own hand to hand combat phase. Alright, so uh, multiple attacks. This is a fighter combat option. Um, first available at 12th level, the human fighter. So in this edition, you have to wait as a fighter until 12th level to get uh, multiple attacks. Fighter can hit his opponent with an attack roll of 2. Or if the fighter can hit his opponent with attack roll of two, he can make two attacks per round against that target, three per round at level 24, and four per round at level 36. Each attack uh, can be a throw attack, lance attack, or disarm. Character can mix and match um, his maneuvers. A smash. Hulk smash. This is a fighter combat option, first available at ninth level to fighters and mystics. Uh, and other experience point totals to demi-humans. Uh, attack hits. Character adds a strength bonus, magic bonus, and entire strength score to the weapon's normal damage. So, uh, if you have a strength of 17, then you attack with your normal attack bonuses, but then if you hit on your damage, you add that 17 to any of your normal damage rolls. Um... So, example, strength of 17 fighter, plus 2 to attack and damage using a sword, plus 2. Another plus 2 attack and damage. Or, uh, would perform a smash this way. Rolls to hit with a net penalty of minus 1, uh, plus 2, plus 2, minus 5 penalty attack roll. Um, if he hits, he rolls 1d8 plus 21, which is 17 plus 2 plus 2 for damage. Um... So, yeah, you can... Basically, Barbarians get to do a similar thing in 5th uh, edition, where they get to take disadvantage on their attack rolls in order to add extra damage. Um, and so that's kind of a precursor of what this smash is. Uh, parry is a fighter combat option maneuver, first available at ninth level. Uh, fighter is not make any attack roll, steady blocks incoming attacks in the entire combat round, and all enemies attacking suffer a minus four penalty to hit him with melee and thrown, but not missile weapons. So this could be good if you have a really high armor class um, sort of tank in the party, and you have a lot of nimble, um, uh, quick other party members this one person can go and just defend 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 and let everybody else rush in and attack the uh, people that are attacking him uh, disarm fighter combat option maneuver uh, only used when fighter attacks a weapon using opponent um, and basically disarm means try to knock the weapon out of their hand now we get to the attack rolls. Ladies and gentlemen, this is where I need to take a drink, which I'm finishing preparing my tea, which has been waiting here since I started recording this. Do do do. Put a little honey and lemon in the tea. And then stir it all up. So it is nice and tasty. All right. Okay, let me take a little. Ah. Okay, attack rolls are only given for targets of AC 19 through AC negative 20. Uh, theoretically, there is no real upper or lower limits. Uh, numbers may be extrapolated indefinitely to the right or left. Uh, any number above 10 that ends in a 0 
it is repeated five times before the table moves on to the next number. Uh, numbers 2 and 10 also repeats five times in which the number drop normally. Instead of going into negative numbers, each 0 or less has a dagger and is explained in the notes. Note that unadjusted roll of 1 should always be a miss. Natural roll of 20 should always hit. There's no critical hits in the original D&D. So attack roll checklist, all characters. The attacker looks on the attack roll table, all characters, and finds the armor class of his target. And the number given on the table is the number he needs to achieve with his roll and bonuses to hit his target. Weapon mastery option. Because they help determine how often a character can use multiple attacks, weapon mastery attack bonuses are applied to the character's attack roll. Character needs to roll an 18 to hit something, but he has a plus 2 bonus from Weapon Mastery. He actually needs a 16 for a successful attack. Okay, self-explanatory. Victim's Armor class may be modified by partial exposure if the attacker is using a missile weapon and the victim is only exposed for part of a round. Um, the attacker rolls a 1d20. Adds pertinent bonuses, so might be strength for melee, dex for missile, and any magic bonuses. Uh, attacker subtracts pertinent penalties from his 1d20 roll. Pertinent penalties include cover if the missile attack roll, magical curses uh, if the curse affects the attack roll. If the result of modified equals or exceeds the number on the attack roll table, the attacker has hit his target. Unadjusted roll of one always misses. If the result was a hit, the attacker now rolls damage. First, he rolls the damage listed for the weapon or the attack. Um, just the roll with any multiplier, such as the thief's backstab ability or a charge bonus. Then the attacker adds any pertinent bonuses to damage. Pertinent bonuses include strength adjustments, magic bonuses, attacker's entire strength score, um, if they do a smash maneuver. The sum of the number rolled on damage and the pertinent bonuses is the amount of damage the victim takes. And here is the table. Now, class and level is over here. Armor class required to hit is over here. And this starts with armor class 19 down to 0. And down below, it's... Armor class negative 1 through negative 20. Now, in this particular... Um, this particular... Uh, edition of the game, the lower your AC, the better it is. So the lower your AC, the harder you are to hit. And then this whole class and level over here, MU, that stands for Magic User. Uh, CTD. Cleric, Thief, Dwarf, F for Fighter, DH for Demi-Human. Okay. Uh, normal Man. What is Normal Man doing there? That is a uh, NPC that doesn't have a class. Uh, is considered a Normal Man. So if they were going to attack something with uh, Armor Class of Zero, the only way they could hit it is with a modified score of 20. And then magic user, in the magic user column, it's the levels of the character. So 1st through 5th level, 6th through 10th, 11th through 15th, 16th through 20, so on and so forth. Cleric, thief, and demi-human. Same goes for that. Fighter, same goes for that. Demi-human. All right, this is where you get into all this A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M. So, uh, that is a, um, uh, th those all have to do with the, um, uh, combat maneuvers, the A through M. All right. Now for the DM, they also get a armor class table. We'll skip on that. Extra damage and so on and so forth. All right, uh, whenever a number needed to hit is zero or less, a dagger appears next to it on the tables. This indicates that the attacker hits unless a natural one is rolled and the attack inflicts additional damage equal to the number with the dagger. 
Thus, if a character needs a 7 dagger to hit, be able to hit, will automatically de hit that armor class unless he rolls a 1. If he does, he inflicts less than or 7 extra points of damage to his target. Uh, this rule is not used. Treat attack rolls table uh, entries of 1 and those of the dagger as a 2. Alright. Thacko. Thacko stands for to hit armor class 0. Someone needs to roll a 7. Not counting any of his or individual bonuses or penalties to hit an armor class of 0. We say he has a Thacko of 7. So let's go back to the table and take a look at this. You'll notice that every class starts at first level with... Uh, needing a 2 to hit a 19, and needing a 19 to hit a 0. So the Thacko is 0. For a 1st through 5th level magic user, also 0. For a 1st through 4th level cleric, thief, or dwarf, or druid, I'm sorry, 1 through 3 for a fighter. And the demi-humans, well, they actually start off with a better... Um, uh, or no, actually, the demi-humans... They get the, um, let's see, what is this? Attack ranks for very experienced enemy human characters. Uh, dwarves, elves, halflings, up to their name level, they use the fighter table. All right. So first through third level dwarf or halfling or um, elf would use that. And then so I guess this means... Cleric, Thief, or D, that's a Druid, not a Dwarf. My bad. Alright, and then, as you'll notice, you get to the point here where class and level, eventually, armor class 0, uh, 34 through 36 level fighter, only needs to roll a 1. Actually, only needs to avoid rolling a 1 in order to automatically hit um, anything with an armor class 0. So, yeah, your characters get pretty insanely powerful as time goes on. All right. Um, then a Thacko. All right. Uh, an individual is Thacko. For all the monsters have a Thacko, so that tells the DM what uh, what they need to roll. Uh, also, a nice thing about Roll20, the character sheet that we use and the system that we use, it will actually tell you what armor classes hit. So when you roll an attack roll, it'll see that, oh, that hit armor class 10. If you're fighting something with armor class 10 or worse, hey, guess what? You hit it. If it's better than armor class 10, you miss. Uh, attack roll modifiers. Um... So there's all kinds of modifiers for the attack roll. Uh, missile combat phase. Each character has chosen to use a missile or thrown weapon, chooses his target, rolls hit, and rolls damage for the attack. Let me see, where, where are we doing on time? Alright, ooh, yeah, okay, this is taking a little bit longer than I thought. Alright, I am going to actually end it there with the attack roll modifiers uh, we'll discuss this and then we are going to come back in the next week and we're going to pick up with missile combat and cover missile combat and magic phase and doing the saving throws and things like that all right so the attack roll modifiers uh, you have circumstance bonuses. So if you're attacking from behind, you have a plus two penalty. Or you have plus two bonus to your attack roll. So that means that unlike in 5th um, edition, the direction your character faces in 5th edition doesn't matter. It does matter in 1st edition. If you can sneak up behind somebody and attack them, they're going to have a lower armor class. If an attacker can't see the target is a minus one penalty. Uh, larger than man sized monster attacks a halfling, you get a minus one penalty. 
and target is exhausted, you get a plus one bonus. And if the attacker is exhausted, you get a minus two penalty. And um, then it talks a little bit about the reasons that characters can become exhausted. All right, well, that is going to do it for this first look at D&D uh, &D Combat. Remember, we'll come back and look at this part two next week. Hope everybody has a wonderful week. If you have any questions about these or if there's anything that you want me to go over more in more detail, let me know in the comments below. Otherwise, hope you guys all have a great week. Hope we will see you back here for uh, next week for the History of D&D Weekly once again. And uh, everybody take care and have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Good night, everybody.